tonight I'm going to be talking about, I'm going to show you photographs of about five or six different kitchens and telling you some details about what the homeowners did and what the architects and builders did to make those kitchens green. And you may look at some of those photographs and maybe the style doesn't particularly appeal to you with one of the kitchens, or maybe there are things you see that you would do a little bit differently. What I'd like you to do when you're looking at these photographs is take away some of the general principles. Maybe you don't want your kitchen to look like some of the photos that I'm showing here, or maybe you do, because there's some really beautiful ones. Just keep in mind as you're looking at them that green, going green is not about a particular style. It's not about having a particular look in your kitchen. You can have a very modern kitchen, a very traditional kitchen, a very earthy looking kitchen, high tech kind of kitchen, and still go green. So it's not about style, it's really about the thought and construction methods that go into it. So just keep that in mind. I'm a real believer in small steps. I believe that the small steps to make our lives and our homes a little more environmentally friendly can really add up. And as we get in the habit of taking those small steps, it gets easier for us to take bigger and bigger steps. And they, these really do add up in terms of reducing our impact on the environment. Um, and and I don't, I'm also a believer in, in the choices that we make matter. Every choice that we make, every product that we choose to buy or not buy for our home or for our kitchen, every item of clothing or the food that we choose to buy, whether it's organically grown or locally grown, all of those choices make a difference in the environment. And every time we make a choice like that for our home or in our lives, we can be choosing to sustain life or to degrade it. And, and I know that that's a pretty weighty responsibility. It can be pretty tough on a day-to-day -day basis when we're trying to get our work done and feed our families and take care of our, all of our obligations. It can be really tough to keep in mind that these choices that we make, these everyday choices, have an impact on the environment and on other people and on other species. One of the things that I do to try to just sort of keep that awareness in the forefront of my mind is I, I keep a poem on the bulletin board in front of my desk. And it's a poem called Common Sense by a writer named Paul Williams. I find it very moving. And I, I'd like to read to you just a couple of excerpts from it. It's a very long poem, it's a long narrative poem. And um, I know in every crowd there's a few people who are poetry phobic. Don't worry if you are. I'm only going to read a couple short excerpts. And it's a, a narrative poem that doesn't even rhyme. So. We'll just look at it real quickly. And you can get the full text online. Paul Williams, the Paul Williams is the writer, and Common Sense is the name of the poem. Our purpose here is to take action and have an effect on the world. We have been born into a moment of unprecedented danger and opportunity. Our failure to act is itself a choice. There is nowhere to hide from this awareness. It is time. It is time for each of us to vote with our lives, our daily lives, for or against the vision of a more hopeful future. Our purpose here is to build a bridge. The purpose of the bridge is to span the distance between our present situation and our vision of a better world. The beauty of a bridge is that once it is in place, anyone can walk on it. How to prevent world catastrophe? One, admit that it could happen. Two, decide that it will not happen. Three, commit your vision and energy to number two without ever forgetting number one. To choose to build a bridge is the essential act of love. There's that love for you again. So that's Paul Williams' common sense. It's just a little piece of a very beautiful poem. I give a lot of talks about green homes in different parts of the state and around the country. And often I spend a lot of time talking about the bigger context. Why green matters, why sustainability matters, what it all means. I'm not going to do that tonight. I'm assuming you know, we're here in the Bay Area. We're pretty conscious of that. We've been conscious of that for a long time. 
some of us may be at different stages in our own lives in terms of making our lives a little bit greener, a little bit more environmentally friendly. And I'm not going to go into that whole background. I'll spare you that. Um, what I'd like to do is kind of plunge into some of the details about what makes kitchen green. And keep in mind, I love talking about kitchens too, because not only because I love kitchens, I love hanging out in kitchens, and I love to cook. So it's just totally a fun book to write. But I like talking about kitchens because everything goes on in the kitchen from a design and construction perspective. So many of the messages you'll be hearing tonight are applicable to other rooms in the home. And the kitchens are a complex place, the plumbing, the structural, the appliances, there's so much going on there. So you can learn so much if you start with the kitchen, if you're greening your home, start with the kitchen. The rest of the home is probably going to be a piece of cake. To, um, just give you a little bit of context. I know there, there are probably people in this room who are really new to the idea of greening your home. There are probably people here who've been doing it in your own homes or professionally for a long time, so I'm aware of that spectrum of expertise. What I want to do to just make sure we're all more or less on the same page is give you an overview of some of the strategies that are involved in making a kitchen green. So we'll just sort of talk about some of those strategies for a few minutes and then look at photos of particular kitchens and see, see how some of those strategies are implemented. So I like to think about a green kitchen or a green home as, as really the, involving three big buckets. It, it helps me and I think it helps other people to kind of drill it down to these three categories. The first one is energy. The second is natural resources. And finally, health. So just sort of keep those in mind as we're going through the, the kitchens a little bit later. Let's talk a little bit now about the, the energy. I put down some strategies here that, that are um, part of how you can make your kitchen more energy efficient, more energy conserving. These are just a short list of strategies. There are dozens more. We could brainstorm together and probably in 10 minutes come up with 100. But these are some big picture ones. Choose energy and water efficient appliances. This is a relatively easy thing to do. If you're in the market for new appliances in your kitchen, one of the easiest things you can do is look for appliances that have the Energy Star logo. You're probably mostly familiar with that. It's a program of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And it gives you some measure of guarantee that that particular product is going to be more energy efficient than average, maybe 10 or 15 percent more energy efficient. So that's the first place to start when choosing appliances. Look for the Energy Star label. You can do a lot better than that, though. And I really encourage you, if you're looking for a refrigerator, a dishwasher, um, those are the, the two big energy units in the kitchen, um, to Look at the actual energy usage of the models that you're interested in. They all have a, a label on them, a yellow and black label called the Energy Guide label that will give you the projected energy use. You can also find all this information online. Do a little bit of homework because you can get a super energy efficient appliance if you put a little extra time into it and compare the energy usage of models. So consider Energy Star sort of your starting point and then do some more homework to find a more energy efficient appliance. The great thing about energy efficiency is it's going to save you money. Some of the Energy Star appliances and energy efficient appliances cost a little more up front, but you're going to get a payback on that relatively quickly. So it's a good strategy. Water efficient appliances, we're talking about the dishwasher, and also making <coughs> sure that you've got a, a water saving uh, faucet in your, your kitchen. Water is an increasingly important issue in California. You know, we're here with global warming, but the sea, our snowpack is, is going to be diminishing. We're going to have increasing water shortages and demands on our water supply. So if all of us can work together and, and save a little bit of water at home, it can make a big difference. Um, high performance windows. If you're doing a major remodeling project in your kitchen and you're planning to replace the windows, Get good window. You're not just double pane windows, but you want to get windows that have what's called a low E coating. It stands for low E acidity coating. There are a lot. Window technology is fairly complicated. Um, I have a lot of information about it in my books. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now, but there are good resources available if you're planning to purchase new windows for your home and you're, you're working on your own, maybe not with an architect or a contractor, or maybe your contractor or architect doesn't really know very much about windows. Again, that's an area where we want to do some exploration to make sure that you're getting really good energy efficient windows. If possible, more, again, 10 or 15 percent 
if you've got air conditioning in particular, it's going to bring your energy costs down so you can save your money there. Design for good daylighting. Um, I've, I've, seen, I've seen too many kitchens that, that are over daylit, that have giant skylights, giant windows, maybe west facing windows, and the sun is pouring in and it's heating up a room that already is pretty hot because it's cooking, people are cooking in there, and the, um, the tend to, people tend to congregate in the kitchen. So daylight is really important from, a, from an indoor quality perspective. People feel better when they're in daylight spaces. There are some studies that show that school kids do <coughs> better on tests when they're in daylight classrooms. So there are a lot of good reasons for designing your kitchen to get good daylight, but you want to be careful in the kitchen to not over daylight it, not have direct sun coming in, especially in the afternoon or early evening. You don't want to be heating up that kitchen and having to run your air conditioner or just be really uncomfortable. Um, design effective, efficient electric lighting system. You know, a lot of people still have this horror of fluorescent lighting. Fluorescent lighting is really getting much, much better. It's um, a, the majority of your lighting now, if you're doing a, a remodel of your kitchen, is going to have to be fluorescent lighting to meet with the state energy code, Title 24. You can do 100% fluorescent in your kitchen and, and have a very beautifully lit kitchen. Uh, I did it in, in my kitchen, and it may, if you're doing a major remodel again, it may be worth hiring a, either an architect who knows a lot about energy efficient lighting, or hiring a residential lighting expert. It could be worthwhile if you're doing a big remodel in your kitchen to get good energy efficient lighting. The nice thing about fluorescent lighting besides saving energy is it's cooler. It's not burning hot like any incandescent light. Incandescent light bulbs are like little heaters. They waste about 90% of the energy that they use putting out heat. It's a really inefficient way to heat your house with light bulbs. Um, so we can do a lot better with fluorescent lighting and more and more we'll be seeing LED lights come out of the market. There aren't a lot of products right now, but within the next five years or so, LED lights are also super energy efficient. So that should add, give us more options for our homes. Summer shade. Not so important where I live in San Francisco. I want the heat in the summer. But around here, summer shade is, is pretty important in you know, designing whether it's having shade trees to keep the heat off of your kitchen walls and off of your home. Um, or putting eaves so that you don't have that summer sun beating down on your windows and on the walls. Just thinking about how can you keep the sun's heat off of the, out, off of the building. Um, it's a lot more effective to keep the sun off of the building on the exterior than to use interior shades. Once the heat comes in, and even if you've got interior shades, you're going to have to do something to get rid of that heat, whether it's air conditioning, or a certain fan, or a whole house fan. Insulation, air leaks, these are basic strategies. These are things that we've been doing for a long time. We can now call them green. One of the nice things about green design is we're all doing a little bit of it. There's a lot more that we can all be doing too. But some of it, a lot of it's common sense. A lot of it is good building strategies, good construction, good quality construction, good insulation, um, quality control. So again, these are just some of the strategies that go into having an energy efficient kitchen. And energy efficiency, as I said, is going to save you money. It's also getting at that big one that's on everybody's mind these days, global warming. You know, obviously, reducing your energy use is reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to that. So it's a good thing all around. Um, second category, natural resources. The biggest thing here in, in terms of conserving natural resources is keeping size in check. And that's a real tough one in our society. Our homes are getting bigger and bigger. We're a pretty affluent society, and, and we like, we're like used to having a lot of space. And when it's, it's only natural when we're in a position to remodel our home, we want to you know, make it a little bit bigger. The problem, obviously, is the bigger our homes, the more natural resources we're using to build them, the more energy we're using to run them. So keep that in mind with your home improvement projects. How can you keep size in check? Are there ways that you can work with the existing layout or change the layout of your home or your kitchen without expanding the footprint of your home? Um, you know, good, good designers, good architects are very clever about layout and about making the most use of space the best use of space without expanding the home. So think quality, not quantity. 
you, some of you may be familiar with a really terrific series of books called The Not So Big House by Sarah Sudanka. I really recommend her books if you're looking at some kind of remodeling project or new home construction. But she really focuses in on that topic of how can we keep size in check and how can we focus on put our, our construction budget and our design budget into quality rather than quantity. Simplify those along with that. You know, how, how, how many dishwashers do you need? How many refrigerators do you need? In some crowds, when I say that, people start laughing. And you know, the idea of having multiple dishwashers, it, some people think it's just crazy. They've never heard of it. You know, I'm like, hello, lots of people have multiple dishwashers and multiple refrigerators. And it's, it's a trend that's accelerating. You walk into a kitchen design showroom, and it's a trend that's being pushed by salespeople with multiple refrigerators. The more refrigerators you have, the more energy you're using. Um, so you know, think about that. How, how can you simplify? How, are these appliances really adding that much to your quality of life? Reuse what you've got. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm here, this, this event is hosted by the recycling program, and I'm, I'm a huge fan of recycling and reuse. One of the biggest questions I get, or most frequent questions I get when I talk about kitchens is, Jennifer, what's the greenest countertop option? Or what's the greenest flooring option? And I always say, the greenest counter or the greenest floor is the one you already have. You can find a way to reuse what you've already got, rather than whipping it out, throwing it in the landfill, and putting in something new. That's the greenest option. Doesn't always work. I understand. I live in the real world. I remodeled my kitchen, and we wound up pulling out quite a bit of stuff. We had old vinyl flooring that wound up in the landfill. Our um, Minimal insulation, there wasn't much insulation, but what was there wound up landfilled. The drywall got landfilled. Um, but a lot of the, we reused all of our appliances, they weren't that old, and they were pretty energy efficient. We didn't feel like we needed to replace them, just to have the latest, greatest, next thing. Um, and we were able to uh, work with our contractor to deconstruct the kitchen so that all of the wood that was coming out. We reused, we had a little stair landing, a wooden stair landing off the back of the kitchen. The carpenters took that apart and reused it to build our new deck. Red wood, good wood, took more labor. It can cost more to recycle and reuse what you've already got. There's more labor goes into it, but it's a lot better than, than carting things off to the landfill. And if there are items that are coming out of your kitchen that you can't use in your own project, Somebody else probably can. There are a lot of, um, I'm not familiar with the building um, reuse stores right here, but I know in the East Palo Alto, there's Whole House Building Supply. Some of you are nodding your head to know those folks. Whole House Building Supply in East Palo Alto. They're salvagers, deconstructors. They go around to homes that are, are going to get remodeled. They take apart those homes, and they bring the materials back to their store, and you can buy those materials. So if you're planning a big remodeling project and you know that you're going to wind up gutting your home or your kitchen, you might want to get in touch with them or someone like them and talk to them about whether they can deconstruct the kitchen so those materials get salvaged. Choose long-lasting products. Again, another common sense no-brainer, but it's a green strategy. If you choose poor quality products that are going to get torn out and wind up in the landfill, that's not good for the environment. So high quality is, is really a good strategy. Choose good wood. What I, what I mean by that is, um, is wood, wood products where you have some degree of assurance that the wood came from well-managed forests, sustainably managed forests. And it's getting a little bit easier to find that these days. Five years ago, it was really tough. It's still tough, but it's a little bit easier. The, there are a number of different certification schemes for wood, and the one that I recommend and that, that a lot of people in the green building industry feel is, is the gold standard for certification is FSC, Forest Stewardship Council. And if you can get wood that has the FSC logo, that's FSC certified, you've got a high degree of assurance that that wood came from a forest or a plantation that was managed in accordance with particularly stringent environmental and social principles. Um, so a lot of local lumber companies are beginning to carry FSC wood. Home Depot has some FSC wood products, but it's, it's really challenging to root them out. 
So the problem is if you're volatile, it all gas, it evaporates from those products, the formaldehyde does, and it's a carcinogen. So, you know, it, is it going to cause cancer? If you have new cabinets in your home that are off gas and formaldehyde, is it going to cause cancer? We don't know. I don't want to be alarmist. We just don't know. We do know that we have no high carcinogen. So we're starting to think in the green building world, how can we just keep these things out in the first place? Kind of a precautionary principle. We know that there may be some concerns here, so let's do what we can to keep these problematic chemicals like formaldehyde out in the first place. The state of California has some legislation pending about reducing levels of formaldehyde in fresh food products, which is really great. In the meantime, there are some cabinet makers in uh, California who are making cabinets with either um, no urea formaldehyde in it or they use phenol formaldehyde, which off gases at much lower levels. So they're coming up with alternatives. And those can be a little bit more expensive, but I think we're going to see the prices coming down as more products are available for the cabinet makers to work with. So there's some good, good options there that some need to pay attention to. Evaluate existing hazardous materials. Again, this is just another good common sense strategy. We need to be doing it. Contractors already are or should be. We're talking about asbestos for the most part and lead based paint. And evaluating whether those materials are in your kitchen before you start remodeling is really important to do. And then figuring out if there's something you need to do. A lot of times there isn't. You can, if you're leaving a material in place, you're not cutting into it, you're not touching it, you're just covering it over, you don't necessarily have to deal with that lead waste paint or asbestos. But it's good to get professional help, get an evaluation done about whether there are any hazardous materials before you start sanding and cutting into it and being able to build the um, Daylighting and outdoors, I, I talked about that, we touched on that earlier, we'll go into that again. Incorporating universal design principles. This is an aspect of green. Um, why? Because um, universal design, that means designing our homes so that they're more accessible to people with all different physical abilities. And what this can mean if a home is designed with universal design principles, it means that people can stay in their homes longer. Um, they, they won't be shut out of their homes because they can't get around. And the nice thing about universal design is that um, it, it, it tends to, if, if you're doing a remodeling project now, if you think about universal design and you build that into your kitchen now, then in 10 or 15 years, when you may need those universal design strategies, they're there already. You don't have to do another remodeling project to make the kitchen a wheelchair accessible for this kids. So it just sort of cuts down on the amount of waste in the future if you think about it now while you're working on the current project. <coughs> Safe. Again, common sense strategies that are also healthy home strategies. So that's the, the triangle. What are some of the things that make acoustics uh, better? Or um, more yeah, that's a good question. The, the kitchen tends to be a very noisy room, and um, a lot of the kitchens we're designing today are much more open than they were in the past. You know, we like to have a great room for now, and the kitchen opening into a, a living <coughs> area or a family area. And so that, that adds to the noise. It's the TV going, and the computer's going, and the computer games, and a lot of people in there. So how, what do we do to mitigate those sounds? Some people love that. And some people want a really vibrant space with lots of things going on, and that's great. I mean, they don't need to worry about the noise. But other people might like a little bit more um, tempering of the sound. And you can use softer materials. Hard materials tend to reflect the noise. So granite, stone. Um, those, those are going to reflect more than metal, metal. If you use some of the softer materials, cork flooring, for instance, is a little bit sound absorbent. Um, wood flooring is a little bit more sound absorbent. Natural linoleum, which we're seeing a lot in the homes. Natural linoleum is a product that's been around for 100 years or more. It's not vinyl. It's kind of what vinyl was designed to imitate. But natural linoleum is made from natural materials. Uh, the Jennifer, bringing that up, I saw something recently on HGTV and they talked about natural linoleum. It was absolutely beautiful. I was, I was shocked because yeah. you think of the old style linoleum. I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we think of linoleum and also we tend to use the word linoleum to refer to vinyl plastic yes. flooring, but the mm -hmm. old natural linoleum is very beautiful. It is a little bit sound too. So thinking about that, also creating nooks. You know, breakfast nooks or just 
faces that are set apart a little bit can be another way to deal with them. A lot of um, cabinets these days are made with really high quality um, hardware. So if the drawers don't slam shut, things go on. Actually, I was in a cabinet manufacturer's showroom a couple years ago, and they were showing off their, their providing cabinet hard, drawer hardware, and they dared me to slam the cabinet. <laughs> I come to and it bangs. <laughs> it's very embarrassing. <laughs> Not that strong. <laughs> Maybe they went back to the shop. But that's another thing to think about um, looking at the hardware when you're shopping around the cabinets. Um, so, what I'd like to do now is show you four or five kitchens and talk about <coughs> some of the green strategies there. And maybe we could get the, turn the lights off because I think the photos will show up a little better. That's the problem. That's perfect. Um, no, but it's similar to the top. So, this, um, this is a kitchen, and um, I'm, kind of, I'm going to race through these, but these photos are all in the green kitchen. So, and I know that the library uh, carries the book, so you can put, put a reserve on it if you want to get a copy of it. Um, so, I didn't get a race through it, but if you want to find the details, you can. This is a little 1910 cottage in Berkeley. It was purchased by two eco architects, Kate Ledger and Carl Monticelli of Berkeley. Um, their firm is called Ledger Monticelli Architecture. And they revamped this cottage, which hadn't been revamped since, I don't think it had ever been revamped. A lot of people would have looked at it and, and said it's a tear down. It's a nice double lot in Berkeley. And they looked at it and said there's a lot of charm in this little 800 square foot cottage. There's a lot that we can do. Um, and one of the things that they did was not expand the footprint and just try to work with the existing space and make it as charming and livable as possible. And I'm starting out with the smallest kitchen in my book. This kitchen is 39 square feet. It's really an apartment-sized kitchen. You know, we see it, little kitchens like this in, in San Francisco apartments and some apartments, but not so much in, in the higher-end homes. And, and they took this little cottage and really put a lot of effort and money into making it very beautiful, but keeping it small. <coughs> some of the strategies for doing that there are, if you haven't been appliance shopping lately, there are a lot of beautiful quality, energy efficient appliances that are smaller scale. So if you have a small household, you don't cook a lot, you don't cook at all, you can buy smaller scale appliances to keep the size of your kitchen down and then use less energy too. So you've got a 24 inch gas range here. There's, in another photo, we'll see a super energy efficient refrigerator freezer that is also smaller scale. Um, the, the cabinets here are made by a cabinet maker in Richmond, Silver Walker Studios, and they are all FSC certified um, cherry in this here with formaldehyde free substrates, formaldehyde free and carbonyl, or not carbonyl, but um, The I don't know if I have a close up of the, some of those counters. Oh, what was the name of Silver Walker Studios. The, um, the, the uh, countertops that are in the foreground there are slabs from a, an oak tree, an old growth oak tree that fell on one of the client's properties. And you'll see a, a photo of that client's kitchen as well. They had some pieces of that oak tree that fell left over and they incorporated in this kitchen. It's a very nice look. And again, if you go to some salvaged lumber yards, not only do many of them carry lumber, that came out of old buildings, but many of them are also carrying urban salvage wood. Trees that are being taken down on people's properties because they're dying or because there's a construction project going on and the tree has to come out. Instead of just chipping that wood up or uh, for mulch or chopping it up for firewood, people are starting to, not starting, people have always done this, but we're paying more attention to to using the wood in the, in a, putting the wood to a better use, a higher use than just mulching it. Not that mulch is bad, I'm a big favor, in favor of mulch. Uh, the other countertops that they're using here, oh, <coughs> I love this shot just because it's a great example of making the most of every inch of space we've got. What's going on here is Carl, the, the architect and builder, he built that little cabinet that's there. It's no wider than the width of the doorway, the opening, but it's perfect for spices. And it matches the woodwork, and it's a little spice cabinet right next to the oven. 
and it just taking advantage of every square inch of space. So again, if you're working with a good designer, a good architect, they can help you with some clever strategy like that, so you don't have to build bigger. This particular countertop material is a, a blend of recycled glass, and it's set in a concrete matrix. There are a number of companies that make products like this now, and they're really great. Um, they're polished, so they're smooth, like granite or like marble, um, but it's 80 to 90 percent recycled glass, glass that's coming out of our curbside recycling programs. And um, they come in all different colors. This one has a lot of yellow, but you can get all different color mixes. Somebody mentioned Vitrasso. That's an East Bay company that's making a product like this. There are a number of other companies that are doing this. Not inexpensive, but too comparable to the nicer granites, nicer stones. We saw that at Stanford last week, and they said the gold contrast is a spear box. Yeah. So it's really a spear box. Yeah, I've seen it with beer. Yeah, I've seen that. And this particular one's really yellow, and I think it may, the yellow may be from old traffic lenses. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> um, but I've also seen that gold, and there's a lot of green that's used from wine bottles, and that sort of yellowish amber color from the white wine bottles. So you can really find products. It's really, really nice. Nice product. So I mentioned the other kitchen, but that the cabinets or the countertops came from this live live edge slabs of oak. This is a house in Morago. It was a 1970s ranch style house, not particularly special, very inefficient from an energy perspective. And uh, the current owners bought it and really wanted to fix it up and make it super energy efficient, make it super green. While they were in the process of thinking about what to do with the home and living in it, two oak trees fell on their property. Beautiful classic California rolling hills with little oak groves and old growth oaks on the property. Two trees fell, they were 300 years old, they didn't stand in their life. The owners were really sad to see that happen. You know, like, There's no way we're going to chop this up and use it for firewood. We have to find some way to use the two small trees. And they went to town. So Dan Jones is the, the homeowner here. She acted essentially as a general contractor. And she found somebody with a portable mini sawmill who brought it onto the property. They milled up these old trees. And most people are going to this extensive. It's really, really an amazing story. She wound up, she wound up using limbs of the trees. These are not the trunks, they're, they're limbs, they're inches from the tree for these posts. They're structural posts. There used to be interior low bearing walls in here that were removed. So they put these posts up. They had a mechanical engineer, a structural engineer do the calculations for them so they could get to approved by the building department. It's critical to do that. These big slabs here and here and in the island, those are slabs cut from the trunk of the oak tree. Most people aren't going to go to this extent with their kitchens, but I, I like to show this because I think it's a really nice reminder that we have local materials and materials all around us that could be put to use. Maybe it's not an oak tree on your property, but maybe it's some materials in your neighbor's garage that they're trying to get rid of. So just thinking about what's around us that we can use. Yeah. Um, wouldn't that wood break down after a while because it needs some sort of preservative? It's got, it's finished with a linseed oil based finish. So that acts as a preservative. Um, but it's not going to break down any more than any other wood. She, she didn't have to dry it, she had to prepare it properly. So the wood, when it was cut into slabs, it was then air dried for two years in her garage so that it would stabilize because it was a living tree. This is a long term project. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of work that has to go into that. And then there's also concern with trees like that that were very recently alive about bugs. And she actually had to treat the wood with borates, which is a relatively non-toxic chemical um, that she would mix in a, a water solution, diluted water solution, and spray on the wood to treat to, to kill off any bugs that might be in there. So definitely a labor of love, but beautiful, beautiful results and really unique. And so again, just thinking about local material, how can we use what's around us? The cabinets here are all bamboo cabinets with uh, a formaldehyde free interior shell. Again, the wood floor in the foreground is maple that came out of the post office in Los Angeles that was being renovated. 
lots of great materials available here. With energy efficient appliances, this particular house has solar electric panels that they put on, as well as a solar hot water system. So they really went to town and did a beautiful job. Just a couple of close ups. So there you can see the bamboo drawer with the oak slab above it. It's a nice look. Um, I like to show this house on, I'm going to race through this one really quickly, but this is just, I show this because it's a nice reminder that you can have any style home and have it be green. It doesn't have to look green. This is a mid-century modern house built in 1949 in Belvedere. And it was recently remodeled, still keeping very much with this mid-century modern aesthetic. <coughs> Looking at this house, there's nothing about it that says green. And nothing announces it except you can just see on the roof there the photovoltaic panel. And if, they, if you were to walk by when they were opening up the garage, they've got a Prius and a Honda inside hybrid cars in there. <laughs> so you can do stealth green. If you want, you don't want to announce that you're green, but you want to do it anyway. The way to do that is to pay attention to energy efficiency, pay attention to what's behind the walls. Energy efficient appliances, really good insulation. They opened up the ceiling. There's been no insulation there before. We put in rigid foam insulation to keep their heating costs down. They have like more air conditioning. Um, super efficient boiler to serve as a hydronic rated floor heating system, under floor heating system. Um, salvaged wood framing for parts of the house where they did it, they showed Again, things you don't see. None of this announces itself. And so it's hard to tell you right about your house being so green when people come in and they're like, you know, where, where's the green? You can't tell. But by paying attention to energy efficiency, knowing where the wood comes from, you, you, you're getting a green house. It's, it's not necessarily about the finishes or the, you know, the final look that you've got. Although this, um, the dining table is again a piece of urban salvage wood. Here they use the finishes that they use, they have marble countertops and Corian countertops. There's <coughs> nothing green about those. I don't think they're bad materials, but they're not solving any hard problem. But that wasn't these, these owners thing. As I said, they were into the energy efficiency, they were into the behind the walls thing. They felt fine using these materials and didn't feel like they had to seek out quote unquote ego countertops because they were getting the energy efficiency right. Um, this one, this is a house in Kensington up uh, above Berkeley. And again, mid-1940s house that needed a lot of TLC, major renovation, and um, they, they didn't want to expand the footprint, but they wanted the house to feel more spacious, so they worked with a really good architect, Catherine Rogers. She opened up, she raised the ceiling in this great room area, the kitchen. Not an inexpensive thing to do, but that really increased the sense of spaciousness in the home without having to expand out into the yard. They have a really lovely yard and they wanted to preserve that. All of the new wood that they used for framing, like the new uh, ceiling trusses there, they all salvaged lumber. The home went down, it was all salvaged yards. And really got into negotiating with these great pieces of lumber. So virtually all of the exposed wood that you see is um, salvaged lumber. The countertops here are a product called Rich Light. Rich Light is a blend of paper and uh, resin. Uh, it's pretty popular material. Uh, whether it's green is kind of questionable, but there's a new product out, some of you may have seen it around, called Paper Stone. It's also similar to Rich Light, but it's made with recycled paper with a, uh, a water-based resin. So if you might want to look for that, check that out. This um, breakfast bar here is made from a piece of an old bowling ring. <laughs> you know, we don't bowl as much as we used to. And so bowling ring just comes down all over the place. And you can find, you can find, actually, I was in the salvage yard this weekend and there was this pile of a couple of hundred bowling pins. I just couldn't think of what to do with them. They looked so great, but they were crying out for some kind of art project or something. But there's really great treasures in salvage yards. This particular refrigerator is a, a model called Sunfall. It's very energy efficient. It's very popular with people who have their own solar electric generation systems because it's a very low energy user. But there's lots of good energy efficient refrigerators out there. There's a close-up of the salvage lumber for the process. 
and the, um, the trellis above the, the kitchen door there, the trellis is also salvaged wood. It's, it's from a company called Trestle Wood. They're in Utah, I believe, and they specialize in taking down old railroad trestles that are no longer in use. And this particular wood came from a trestle that went through the Great Salt Lake. And the owners, Tom and Barbara, told me that when the lumber was delivered and they cut into it, they could actually smell the brine. This wood is in pickles for a long time. So, trestle wood. Trestlewood? Uh -huh. That's the name of the company. That's the name of the product. Yeah, if you just search on Trestlewood. Um, and then finally, the, the last kitchen I'll show. This is in a, a Victorian house in San Francisco. The kitchen was modernized, um, and there's a lot of green things going on here, but just one, one idea that I wanted to put out there, because it's a little bit of a unique one, is that the, the homeowner here was trying to pay attention to concept called design for disassembly, or sometimes it's called design for deconstruction. Basically, as much as we love our kitchens, you know, we design these new kitchens, we, we, we model our homes, we've got this great new space and we think it's the best thing ever. What's going to happen when we sell our home? The kitchen's going to get remodeled. It's just what happens. And chances are a lot of that stuff that's in your kitchen is going to get torn out. So this fellow, Jeff Gaynor, who's also an architect, he started thinking, well, how can I design my kitchen to meet all of my needs today and yet make it easier to reduce waste in the future? So he designed the open shelving system here out of three very simple materials. Wood, it's Douglas fir that came out of the wall studs that were once the wall studs from the walls that used to be here that he took out. His carpenter took those studs and refashioned them into uh, shelving. So we've got wood, we've got the steel posts that, that serve as reports for the shelving, and then some of them have glass floors. So that's it. And they come apart very easily with hand tools. So somebody in the future can take these shelves down and reuse them or recycle those components. And so it's just a little thing, but it's something to keep in mind. What can you do today to minimize waste in the future? And the next time the kitchen is going to get remodeled, because it's trust me. Um, again, a lot of green things going on in this kitchen. This is also a rich white countertop that they're using here. Um, and here you can see some of those oxidized nail marks that you can just working out of the, the, um, the walls that were in this kitchen area previously. This table also is fashioned from uh, the same Douglas for steps that were in the walls. So don't, don't throw that one out if you got an older home. It's got great wood in it. So that's a kind of quick tour of uh, green homes and green ideas uh, for your kitchen.